Good morning, everyone. Okay, looks like everyone has joined us from the waiting room. Good, uh, good Wednesday morning. Happy uh, nearly summer. Uh, I'm Gil Price. I'm the executive director here at Condominium Law Group. I have our two partners, uh, Valerie Oman and Ken Herr, who are joining us for our weekly Q&A. A couple of announcements. Um, you should have received uh, an email from me last week, last Wednesday afternoon, about do your fine and violation notices comply with Washington statutes. Um, we're offering to review those free of charge. If you did not see that email, let me know. You can email me at executive director at condolaw.net or info, I-N-F-O at condolaw.net and I'll forward that to you. Um, so the other uh, topic or item that I'd like to just remind everyone on, and I'll be sending out an email on that later today, is the increase in county recording fees. Uh, we didn't have anything to do with it, just so you know. Uh, the recording fees are gonna be increased by $100 uh, starting July 25th. Currently they're 10350 for the first page. They'll be increasing to 20350 uh, for the first page on July 25th. Uh, again, I'll send out an email uh, just letting you all know about that. Uh, I'm going to stop talking because we have a number of questions on our list of things that we'd like to cover with you today. So, and we are recording this. I'll have it on our YouTube channel later today as well. So thanks all for joining us. It's good to see many of you here. Thank you. Thank you everybody for being here. As Gil mentioned, I'm Valerie Oman, and I'm sure most of you already know that, although we might have one or two new folks with us this week. So thank you for being here. As always, we are gonna start with a quick update on the status of the proclamation, which is Proclamation 20-51, which pertains to community associations in Washington state. It's been in effect since April 17th of last year, and it remains in, in effect right now, and probably will remain in effect um, in its entirety until Senate Bill 5011 takes effect on July 25th. So as a reminder, Proclamation 20-51 prohibits community associations from charging late fees and interest on unpaid assessments. It also authorizes associations to conduct meetings remotely and conduct votes by mail, even if your documents would not have previously authorized you to do those things. The nice thing about Senate Bill 5011, of course, is that when it takes effect at the end of July, July 25th, again, is the date on that, it will make permanent the allowance for virtual meetings and voting by mail. And it will also add something to that, which is the ability for associations to send notices to your owners via electronic means once your owners opt in to that. So just a reminder, you cannot require people to accept notice electronically. And unless people opt in, you have to still send it to them by regular mail but once Senate Bill 5011 takes effect on July 25th, you will have the ability to send notices electronically on an opt-in basis. So we're pretty sure the intent as, as has been communicated to us is that there will be a seamless transition or basically that the proclamation will continue until the Senate bill takes effect at the end of July. So there should be no gap between the two. So in case any associations are concerned about things like well, what if we schedule a virtual meeting and then the proclamation is rescinded before the Senate bill becomes law? That is very, very unlikely to happen. But if it were to happen, one of the things that we've said here before is that the risk in conducting a meeting remotely, even under those circumstances, would be very, very low. So the next thing I wanna cover is just a general COVID update. There's not a whole lot that's brand new here. As you all probably realize, all of the counties in Washington state remain in phase three of the um, Healthy Washington Roadmap to Recovery Plan. And that means a lot of different things in terms of the uh, maximum number of people that are allowed to gather indoors and outdoors. And also some changes to the masking rules have been made in recent weeks. So I'm gonna recap those really quickly. Um, also, as a reminder, the governor has indicated that unless something goes sideways with the current trajectory of either COVID cases and also our vaccination um, situation in Washington state, we are looking at a full reopening of the economy on June 30th of this year. So we're less than a month away from that now. 
I do want to remind everybody that the uh, full reopening of the economy does not mean that the COVID related state of emergency is over. That would be a separate announcement that may or may not happen at the same time. And so just keep that in mind. That doesn't mean that uh, we go back to living like COVID never happened. And it doesn't mean that the state of emergency will necessarily end at that time. As far as the updated mask guidance, one of the things that we talked about last week was the fact that uh, Washington State has followed the CDC's guidance and has indicated that vaccinated individuals, fully vaccinated individuals, and that definition means you've received both doses of your COVID vaccination at least two weeks or more ago. Fully vaccinated individuals have the option of not masking when they are in public places with a small set of exceptions that include things like public transportation, medical or health facilities, um, you know, if you're in a jail or a juvenile detention facility, things like that, places like that, you still have to wear masks. But it's also really important for any of you who do business in or have contact with associations in King County to realize that the King County Health Executive has uh, released guidance indicating they strongly encourage people to continue wearing masks indoors regardless of vaccination status. And they also strongly encourage businesses to continue requiring employees and customers to mask when they are indoors in their, uh, within their businesses. So in case it's helpful to know this, condo law is continuing to require employees and customers to mask. Our door remains locked, so we're not just open to the public as far as you know anybody being able to, to walk in off the street. Um, employees are required to wear masks to come into the office. When you're in your own office with your door closed, and we're all vaccinated, so that's kind of a, a, you know nice for us. We don't care what people do in their own office with the door shut. Um, but in all of the common spaces of our building, we are requiring everybody to continue wearing masks. So. We had a question that came in uh, sort of at the 11th hour this morning about um, conducting meetings, indoor meetings with social distancing and requiring vaccinated or unvaccinated individuals to wear masks and whether this was a reasonable thing to do at this point. And so when I'm done chatting, I'm going to put a number of links into the actual chat on Zoom, including the phased chart for the Washington Roadmap to Recovery and some guidelines from the state on um, fitness facilities, which a lot of our clients have within their communities, but also indoor recreation facilities, which we think are a pretty close approximation, a good set of guidelines for our community associations to follow in terms of when and how to start using your community spaces. So I think that our answer to the question of when it's reasonable or whether it's reasonable to start having indoor meetings if you require social distancing and masking for un unvaccinated individuals is that as long as you're following the guidelines within the, um, that I'm gonna be linking in the chat later for indoor recreation facilities, um, we think it's okay, it's, it's a reasonable thing to do, but I will point out that it becomes problematic to only require unvaccinated individuals to wear masks. I realize that that's consistent with the guidance from the state and from the CDC, but the other thing that we have been telling associations all along is that we think that there is a, a fairly high degree of risk associated with asking people to, to prove their vaccination status within your communities. We don't think that you should be doing that. So then it becomes a question of, do you just do it based on the honor system? Tell people, if you're not vaccinated, you have to wear a mask. If you are vaccinated, you're free not to wear a mask. Um, you could choose to do that. I don't think it's, it certainly does not go against any of the current guidelines. In fact, I think it's consistent with the current guidelines. Um, I do think though that it, it could create its own set of problems, including that there's already a lot of distrust right now, with, just within our society at large between people who wear masks and people who don't wear masks and people who are vaccinated and people who are not vaccinated. And there's all kinds of judginess flying around everywhere about all of these things. And so it might be easier and simpler to say, sure, we will allow indoor meetings as long as we are under at or under the capacity that's allowed by the phased reopening guidance that we've got here. And as long as we maintain social distancing and as long as everybody wears a mask, so just because you can allow people who are vaccinated 
to go without a mask within your facilities does not mean that you have to. And we think that it would be reasonable and certainly more risk averse to just make everybody wear a mask so you don't have to deal with questions of who's vaccinated and who's not vaccinated and sort of people pointing fingers at each other or resentment among folks who do or don't have to wear the masks. So I hope that answers the question and feel free to you know, put any follow-up questions that you have on this topic in the chat. Ken, did you wanna say anything before I keep moving through the questions that we've got? No, I think I'm good, thank you. Okay. So the next topic that I wanna cover is that, uh, I think we said this last week or a week before last about how the legislature really surprised us this session because there were all kinds of things that popped up in different bills that we were not aware ahead of time were, was, were going to be coming down this, the pike, so to speak. And also we talked about how typically bills take effect 90 days after they are signed by the governor. And so a couple of weeks ago, we, we became aware of and mentioned in our Zoom um, House Bill 1482, which we understood was going to um, basically provide pr protections for homeowners living in community associations who might be subject to foreclosure for unpaid assessments. And because most bills take effect 90 days after they're signed. We assumed that this one would as well. And so I guess I need to take my mom's advice about assuming anything. <laughs> and I'm sure you can imagine what my mom would have said about that. Um, because we've learned now that House Bill 1482 actually took effect on May 10th. And so that was lightning fast, uh, much faster than we expected. And it does create some hoops that associations have to jump through before you can start foreclosure proceedings against a delinquent homeowner. So it doesn't mean you can't foreclose, but there are steps that you have to follow and thresholds that have to be met before you can do so. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk a lot more about this bill in the coming weeks because probably we're gonna work, with, work within our office to develop some sort of um, either flow charts or kind of you know a step-by-step set of instructions for community associations to follow. So you make sure that you're doing all the things that you're supposed to do. But the, the short version of it is that um, it creates a minimum unpaid assessment amount that you have to meet before you can start a foreclosure proceeding. And it's actually not very high. It's a minimum of either three months assessments or $200. And that has to be calculated exclusive of late fees or interest or fines or other charges on the account. So this is just the actual um, monthly or I suppose special assessments that are unpaid. Um, we have some questions, I have some questions and we're gonna be doing a really deep dive into the statute to make sure that there isn't anything in there. I've already read it twice, but I didn't see anything in there about how you calculate what's paid or unpaid based on application of payments. So I think, and I'm going to confirm this, that you can still apply payments in a manner that's consistent with your governing documents within each community. Um, but in, in any case, there will be a minimum assessment amount that has to be met in order for a foreclosure lawsuit to be filed or for any foreclosure to be um, initiated. You also have to send a notice of default. And there's, a, it's, there's actually a form, it's all typed out right in the statute that gives people 90 days notice of the fact that they could lose their home in a foreclosure action if they don't address the, un the unpaid assessment amount. And it's got all kinds of information um, and resources available to the borrower, like you have to put housing counselor phone numbers in there, things like that. Um, and it, it, it looks like there's also a requirement that if the borrower, bar I keep using the word borrower, it's not a borrower, the homeowner, I'm using that word because a notice of default is very common in the context of a lender foreclosing on a mortgage. Um, and so this is just bringing that procedure into our world here. If the homeowner requests it um, under that notice of default, the association is, is probably required to go ahead and participate in a mediation with the, with the homeowner as well. I will offer that having worked with banks in the past, um, and also just having lived through the last recession where there were so many foreclosures, the number of people who actually take advantage of those mediation provisions is relatively low, the percentage of them. Um, but you do have to offer it and you do have to say yes if they ask for it. And then a minimum of 180 days after that minimum threshold amount accrues, that's the fastest you can start a foreclosure lawsuit. 
In 2024, that time frame is going to go down to 90 days. So they they in, when the the way the statute is written is that it goes into effect right now. It went into effect um, just under a month ago, and the fastest any community association can file a foreclosure lawsuit is 180 days after the delinquency arises, or actually it might even be 180 days after the minimum threshold amount is met. Um, in 2024, the that time frame is going to compress down to 90 days. So I'm not sure whether the reason they made it longer now is to get everybody used to it because of COVID and sort of the struggles, the financial challenges that some people are experiencing because of COVID. But in any case, it's longer. It just creates a longer waiting period before you can foreclose at this point. Um, and also you can't send the notice of default until the account has been delinquent for 90 days. And so that, that's essentially what creates this 180 days is the 90 days of waiting to send the notice and then 90 days waiting once you've sent the notice because the notice gives the owners 90 days to cure the default before you can start a foreclosure proceeding. So <clears throat> Ken, did you wanna jump in with something? You look like you have something to say. Well, sure. One thing to keep in mind is that this new special notice is different than you sending a normal delinquency notice that the account has unpaid the previous month. But it is gonna require that most associations look at their collections policies and modify them to deal with these new requirements. Uh, in my mind, there's no question that this was a, a concern by the legislature that there was gonna be a flood of foreclosures because of people who couldn't pay during the COVID pandemic. And I think that's why the six month minimum time before you can foreclose, it does not appear to affect other kinds of collections remedies. So if you typically went to small claims court over a, uh, a delinquent assessment, you could still go to small claims court. That's not affected. But I think the key concepts in this are you can't foreclose on a house for a, a piddly amount of money. So if your association dues are 50 bucks a year, you're not gonna be able to foreclose on it and for at least a couple of years. You cannot foreclose on a house for unpaid late fees, interest and fines. It has to be at least a minimum of $200 of actual assessments. Um, there are in the notice requirements, not only do you have to mail it to the owner of record, you have to mail it to the home in addition and it doesn't matter that you've got electronic notice for your community, this has to be sent by first class mail as well. And you're not gonna be able to, for the next two years, foreclose on any property faster than 180 days, meaning you can't initiate the lawsuit. And if it takes a year to get through that process, you basically are extending by at least four to six months, I would say, the practical amount of time to see a foreclosure through. And the other thing is that this law has been set up to affect every kind of community association. And it, it covers every one of the four statutes under which any community association is, is controlled. They all have this consistent notice requirement and then the 180 day minimum time before a foreclosure can be started. And if you've got something like a condominium doing a special assessment for a construction project, that means you may have some additional challenges on when you can anticipate actually recovering enough money to have your uh, payment for your contractors. So you'll need to think about those things. Uh, there are a lot of, I'll say uncertainties as happens with many of these statutes. The legislators don't actually think about the the day-to-day -day mechanics. And so there's gonna be an enormous number of questions about, you know, can you send this notice early to make sure you've done it? Uh, can you send it twice or three times? Is it a notice that comes from the association or can you have your attorney or collections agency send it? And some of those things, we don't know that there's a correct answer to yet. And until uh, lawsuits start to figure that out, we're not gonna know what the legislative intent was because the courts are who decide what the legislative intent was. So it was set up as a 
additional set of hurdles to protect people who are delinquent. And it's going to just make life challenging for all the managers and homeowner associations that have delinquencies. And one of the things that I will offer in addition to Ken's comment about needing to look at our collection policies to make sure that they are consistent with what's required under the bill is that this I think uh, weighs very heavily in favor of being generally proactive about delinquencies. One of the things that we have um, that we've seen with some of the accounts that have been, you know, sort of trickling into our office over the last couple of months, I think as people realize that, you know, the proclamation wasn't going to go anywhere anytime soon and stopped kind of waiting basically to take action on some of these things is that uh, some of these accounts that are coming to us are, are already delinquent by six months or a year or a year and a half. And so if you don't send them to your attorney that long, and if your association hasn't been really proactive about making sure you send the notices that are required under the statute, you could be looking at a minimum of a 90 day delay before you're able to do a foreclosure, um, added on to the normal time frame that you would already be looking at with your attorney's involvement. And one of the reasons for that is that when we send a demand letter, there are very strict rules and guidelines for what we can and can't do under the Federal Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So we can't send the our de demand letter and the notice of default that's required by the statute at the same time, because there's a, 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 a line of court cases interpreting this idea that uh, you can't basically do anything in the demand letter, in our demand letter, that overshadows, that's the language that the courts use, overshadowing, that overshadows the purpose of the demand letter. In other words, uh, we really have to stick to the association, you owe the association this much money, here's how much it's going to grow over the next 30 days. There's language that we have to put in there by statute under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And that's essentially it. We're not really able to put anything else in the letter that could just distract from the purpose of the demand letter under the FDCPA. So when we send our demand letter, we have to give 30 days under the FDCPA for a response. And only once that 30 days is over, would it then be an option for us to send that 90 day notice of default to your homeowners? So it could that could mean that we're looking at 120 days from the time we send our initial demand letter to when we even have the option of doing a foreclosure lawsuit if we're the ones that are doing that notice of default for our clients. And so one of the things that we'll kind of look at, I think as a practical matter internally, but also as we're advising our clients is whether it makes more sense to go ahead and produce these forms for the associations to send directly. Uh, but it also leaves procedure like legal procedures in the hands of lay people, um, which carries its own set of risks. So. Um, so as Ken is as Ken was mentioning, we'll we'll learn and, and understand and kind of figure out a lot more as we kind of slog through the statute and, and learn as we go essentially um, with the new law. So I just put a link in the chat to uh, this House bill, which was signed into law and took effect on May 10th. Uh, everybody should look over it. If you have questions for us on this, feel free to pop in, pop them into the chat today, or you can email them to Gil for us to cover at a future Zoom. Gil's email address is info at condolaw.net. Gil, did you have something you wanna cover? We do, I, we have a couple of questions that have come to me directly. Uh, the first one is uh, this person's understanding that any meeting where the board meets, whether they vote on anything or not, needs to be open to the community. Is that correct? What about workshop meetings? And I have a couple okay. more, and I have a couple more. We actually so we, we actually covered this um, last week as well. So you might benefit from looking at the uh, YouTube video of our Zoom last week. But some communities do have open meeting requirements. Um, under the HOA Act, board, me boards, board meetings are required to be open. Under Wakaiwa as well, they're required to be open. Um, as far as I remember, I don't think either of the condominium statutes require open meetings, but your documents might, even if the statute doesn't. Ken, is that correct? My understanding on the way the statutes fall on that? That is correct, yes. So um, <clears throat> that what that means is that at any meeting where the board is certainly taking action on behalf of the association needs to be an open board meeting to which your owners are invited or <clears throat> of which notice is sent to your owners. And then of course you need to have minutes 
to track the decisions that are made by, by the board. We did cover the question last week of whether like boards can have a, work, a working session that is not an open board meeting. And one of the comments that Ken made that I thought was really valuable is that the whole point of requiring open board meetings is to keep your ownership informed of what the board is doing, what the board's discussing, the decisions that are being made, the information that's being given to the board or shared among the board members. And so if the working session is essentially intended to replace a board meeting so that it doesn't have to be open, we think that that creates a problem and, and certainly um, goes against the legislative intent of having board meetings be open so that your own owners can stay informed of things. That, that working meeting would clearly be a violation of Ukiowa. And it's not, it's not established by the courts yet whether it would be a violation of the Homeowners Association Act. Our recommendation would be just make them open. So we have another question, which is, um, would you consider a flag with a government official's name on it a political sign? Sounds a bit like a loaded question with more information behind it. Yeah, well, it it's almost certainly a kind of flag, you know. I'm sure it's a Trump flag, but <laughs> the, you know, my answer would be that the, if it, if we're talking political signs, that is supposed to be related to elections, okay? Because that's the way the statutes are written. You can regulate them for a period of time before and after the elections. If you're treating it more like a statement like no Iraq war or Black Lives Matter, then you're treating it as a different kind of free speech, which there's much less clear regulation about. And I'd want to know more specifics before I could provide uh, actual legal advice about whatever this flag is. I think Agreed. the question may have come from a board member or a homeowner. So in, the, in this instance, please reach out to your legal counsel for your association, whoever yes, that might be. This is as good a time as any for us to remind you all, we're trying to be better about saying this at least once every cool. week that this is a forum for us to give general information and guidance for people within our industry. It is not a forum in which we can give legal advice. And so we do often run into questions that are either so full of detail that they can't be covered without giving legal advice or also sometimes folks will ask us a question and then when we don't answer the way you want us or hope that we will answer, you kind of tweak the question and keep asking it in different ways, hoping that you, you know that you'll get a different response. Um, if if you're if you're feeling like I might be calling you out by by saying any of those things, <laughs> number one, I'm totally not calling you out. But number two, maybe that means the question that you have really should be put to your association attorney, so they can give you legal advice that is tailored to your circumstances and keeps the specifics of your governing documents in mind because we can't do those things on this Zoom Q and A. So. Okay, so I think this might have been a follow-up question to your comment about collections, Valerie. What is the minimum threshold in dollars? Does Either three months assessments or $200. Uh, so this person, whichever, is, whichever is greater, excuse me, sorry to interrupt. Can you repeat that, please? It's either a, a sum equal to three months assessments. So if you're a condo association and your monthly dues are 250 bucks a month, then there has to be $750 in unpaid assessments or $200, whichever is greater. So, and that that's, I think, intended to sort of cover the gap between condo associations that have monthly dues that can be quite high versus, you know, some HOAs have annual assessments of $150. And so the, so it's $200 or three months of unpaid assessments, whichever dollar amount is higher. And also keep in mind that you cannot include late fees, interest charges, fines, um, or other like, I don't know, reimbursable costs, other charges in calculating that amount. It has to just be unpaid assessments. So for people who are gonna be sort of uh, um, unexcited about reading 34 pages of this <laughs> bill, the key is just look at page eight to start. The first seven pages are just telling you what the current language of the statute is. 
And then on page eight, you can see there are un underlined sections. That is the only change to the bill that, or to the statute that the legislature has adopted. So you don't have to read about 90% of this document to get all of the substance. So skip the first seven pages, look at page eight where the underlined and bold sections are. And then you can see on page nine, it goes to a whole bunch of stuff you don't have to read again until you get to page 17. And so each of the, the applicable statutes, meaning Ukiowa, the Condo Act and the HOA Act are included in this particular bill and they all have the same language. So you can get the substance of this by actually reading only a couple of pages. Agreed. Okay, so we have a flag clarification, just so we'll put it on the record. It was actually a Biden flag. So, okay, so we lost that one. All right, so let's go to another question here. If the governing documents, you know, I, I'm just a thought for Ken and Valerie and everyone here on our Zoom today. I think we could probably have an entire Zoom just on meetings because there seems to be always clarification and confusion around that particular topic. So segue into this next question. If the governing documents only require two board meetings per year, can the other board meetings that are held not require an open invite? No. No. Okay. Every board go. meeting there that you have, if you have an open meetings requirement, every board meeting that you have must be open to your owners. Also, don't have board meetings only twice a year. I'm sorry, but like the the attorney that you know the the attorney that needs my clients to be able to make decisions and answer questions more frequently than every six months is cringing at, at the idea. And and as a really quick aside, I will also even offer that every other month can be problematic. I had a a, a client recently that. Um, just for whatever reason, their board is not interested in meeting every month, so they meet every other month. And then on top of that, the whole transition to virtual meetings because of COVID was really um, just a tough battle for this particular group who previously wouldn't even let board members call in and participate by teleconference in you know, board meetings prior to COVID. Um, but they, they almost lost out on a huge settlement on an, a delinquent, an account that had been delinquent for years with a deceased owner. Um, and there was a settlement offer on the table and they almost lost out on something like $35,000 because of the infrequency of their board meetings. So, uh, you know, that's, it's not always doom and gloom and like something horrible is going to happen, but Regular board meetings, I think, are really, really important. And, and you cannot replace a, a real-time discussion uh, with emails. You just can't, nor should you, because that can create a whole set of problems on its own. So, okay, Neil, did no you have more, any other no questions? More questions at the moment? So please continue. Thank you. Okay. All right, the next question that we had come in was basically about, uh, is it really true that budget ratification meetings don't require a quorum? And what is the law or the statute that supports that? And the uh, this is straight out of the Wakiowa budget ratification um, section, which is RCW 64.90.525, subsection 1A. <clears throat> So again, I'll put this into the chat, but it's RCW 64.90.525, subsection 1A. And this is the idea. In order for the owners to reject a budget, more than half of the voting power in the association has to vote against it. Otherwise, it's automatically ratified. That does not require a quorum. The only thing that will, that will sort of um, make the default is that the budget is ratified automatically. The only thing that will change that is if more than 50% of the voting power in your community votes to reject it. So you don't need a quorum. That's the citation within Wakiowa for the rat ratification process. Um, and if you have any other questions on that, feel free to let us know. And then the last that question that I- to all oh, communities. Yes, thank you. Thank you. The last question that I'm going to cover before I cede the floor to Ken is um, at a recent annual meeting, the residents had a sort of coup and made a motion to remove two of the board members. As the manager, I said it was impossible because they didn't have um, 
they didn't have it on the agenda and several days notice was needed. Is this a fact of law? Um, so there are two sections of the nonprofit corporation statutes that mention the removal of directors. RCW 2406-130, that's from the, the Miscellaneous Nonprofit Corporations Act. Um, most of our clients are not incorporated under that act, but all it says is that a director may be removed from office pursuant to any procedure, therefore, provided in the Articles of Incorporation. The Nonprofit Corporations Act under which more of our clients are incorporated is um, RCW 24.03 and it's section 103, so 24.03.103. And it, it starts by saying the bylaws or articles of incorporation may contain a procedure for the removal of directors. And if they don't, then here's how you do it. And the statute does not require advance notice of the intent to remove board members or um, that it be on the agenda. And it just says that you can remove directors by the vote of two thirds of the voting power at a meeting where you've achieved quorum in person or, or with proxies. So the thing is though, your governing documents will often, will often have provisions about how to remove directors from the board. And then Wakiowa itself does require advance notice and that the removal of the director in question be on the agenda. Um, in advance of the meeting. So, so the short answer to this question is, number one, it depends on what statute you're governed under. If it's a Wakiowa community, then absolutely it has to be on the agenda before it can be voted on at the, at the association meeting. Uh, number two, if you're not a Wakiowa community, check your governing documents because your governing documents are the provisions which will control over the nonprofit statutes. And if your documents are silent, then you look to the Nonprofit Corporations Act as a sort of fill in the blank provision. And in, in this particular case, the procedure is just that any director elected by the members may be removed with or without cause by two thirds of the votes cast by members having voting rights represented in, at a meeting where there's a quorum present. So. So if you're a Wakiowa community, it has to be notified, you know, it has to be on the agenda ahead of time. If your documents say that it has to be on the agenda ahead of time, then you need to comply with your documents. Only if neither of those is true, do you then fall back on the Nonprofit Corporations Act. So Ken, did you want to jump in with anything more on that? Well, I would offer that I think the manager made a very reasonable decision to tell them they couldn't do it. Agreed. Even if it turns out to be wrong because the cure is very easy. The cure is they just go ahead and call another meeting and they can vote to remove the board member. And so the, the low risk option is what the manager chose, which was to uh, postpone that decision until another day when you could be sure that the membership of the community knew that was gonna be on the agenda and could make an informed decision. Okay, I am done with my part. So unless Gil, do you have questions that came in while I was talking just now or are we done with my part? Yeah, there is um, governing doc. Hmm, governing doc says dues can only be increased 5% annually. Is there an RCW that might trump this? I'm gonna let it Ken depends, take this It depends on whether you are a homeowners association under the HOA Act or a condominium association. If you are a homeowners association, which is the most common place we see these, Ukiowa has wiped out that provision in the declaration. So the, uh, the section of Ukiowa that imposes the, um, the budget ratification process from 6495.25 also says that that budget ratification process supersedes every other provision related to budgets in the HOA governing documents. And so what it does is it means that there's no longer a requirement to get an affirmative vote from the membership in order to increase dues more than five or 10% or whatever it is. The owners still have the power to prevent a large increase because they can band together and reject the budget. Uh, if you have that kind of a provision in your condominium documents, uh, it was not addressed by the legislature. 
And I might suggest that you need to have someone look very precisely at the requirements in your documents. And uh, it, it may be that you have to work around it, but that's gonna be legal advice I can't give in this call. Bill, are there more questions or should Ken go on with his? Uh, Ken, please proceed, thank you. Okay, so I had one more for the group, which was there's a community where a homeowner has been doing work for the association. And the association has a written contract saying that instead of payment, the association will credit the homeowner on their annual assessments. And the question is, is this appropriate? Uh, is there argument in the CCR that doesn't say they can do that? Or is that why a contract is written? I would offer, usually I see an agreement like this as an attempt to avoid somebody paying taxes. And if that's your intent, then you are doing something wrong. So if you have an agreement with an owner to provide services, there's usually nothing that prohibits that. I would certainly recommend that you make sure an attorney review the agreement because you wanna make sure you're not creating an employee relationship if you can avoid it. You wanna make sure they remain an independent contractor because you have less liability in that regard. Um, if you are crediting them or giving any discount on their association dues, then that is income to the owner and you need to report it to the IRS under the same guidelines as you would report any other income to an employee or to an independent contractor. So if the credit is more than $600 a year, it would require either a 1099 or a W-2 form be filed with the IRS. Uh, there may be an attempt to try and reduce how much income is coming into the association by doing this. We think that there should be no tax consequence for that. But again, you would have to recognize the amount owed for the dues as income to the association and then recognize the credit to the owner as an expense for the association in order to properly track your expenses and uh, record income. Okay. Uh, we have seen some of our most difficult problems related to money and finances and what it certainly looks like theft of funds related to individual owners or board members acting as employees or consultants or contractors for the association. And it is especially problematic where you have the person in control of the checkbook paying themselves. And so if you're going to do something which is setting up an owner as a a service provider, we strongly recommend that you do so with good written guidelines, make sure that the board has the authority to terminate that agreement at any time for any reason, make sure that you are properly insuring the association so that if the person is serving and has an injury or some other kind of claim that the association is protected, make sure that you have fidelity insurance or a fidelity bond in place so that the money of the association is protected in case it's being misused. Uh, there's just a lot of, uh, of mines in the minefield related to having an owner or a board member serve as a vendor to the association. And I'm not saying it may not be a lot cheaper and a lot easier than some other options. And there are times where it might be appropriate, but we do think you should make sure that you and the individual have a common understanding about what it is you're, they are going to do, how much they're going to be compensated, how they're going to be compensated, and that the association is going to fulfill all of its obligations to the federal government to report any income or waiver of association's uh, dues. And that's all I've got, Gil, unless you have something else that's come in. All right, this is the last chance if anybody else. has questions to pop them in the chat. 
I do have one public service announcement for all of our community association managers. It's kind of, it's not really creeped up on us, but it's hard to believe it's June 2nd already. Uh, we hope to see you in our virtual uh, booth next Thursday at the Was Washington State Community Association's Institute Made for Managers Day, taking place next Thursday. That would be June, um, what's today, the 2nd, so it's 7, ten. 1, the 10th, right? So next Thursday, June 10th, WSCAI Made for Managers Day, only for community association managers. Uh, I think, Ken, you're speaking at that, if I remember correctly. Yes, I am. So uh, we hope to see you virtually and um, hopefully our CA day in, I think it's on September, October. I'm not that far yet in my calendar. Um, hopefully that will be done by, uh, done in person. Uh, that would be certainly my hope um, so we can see everyone. So um, I don't see, oh, let's see, hold on. I forgot if the last time you said posting a schedule is okay, 14 to 50 day notice for open meetings with, 50, with Senate Bill 5011. Can you please clarify? So, I think it depends on what somebody means by posting a notice. So notices, if you're, if you're mailing out ahead of time, you know, a year's worth of board meeting uh, schedule, uh, and you send it to your owners in the manner that is authorized by your documents, because remember, we don't have electronic notice provisions right now. Um, I think that that's fine. You can certainly send, send the schedule, schedule out in advance. Um, I think that posting, if you're, if you're actually talking about posting it, I don't know, like on, a, you know, on the bulletin board by the mailboxes or on the association's website, it's fine to do that, but it does not replace sending a notice to people in the manner that's required by your documents. If the question is whether the notice provision requires you to send out a notice, you know, 14 to 50 days before every individual board meeting, I think what we said last time we covered this, Ken, was that we thought sending the board meeting, uh, the board meeting schedule out further in advance was probably fine. What do, am I remembering that correctly? I believe so. If you have a standing meeting on the third Thursday of every month and you have given notice of that to the owners, you don't need to also send a notice out 14 days in advance every month of that meeting. But if you held a special board meeting on the first Thursday, you would need to provide 14, 50 days notice for that. Great. Maybe we're, are we letting everybody out a little early to enjoy the sunshine and the heat today? <laughs> All right, everyone, enjoy the, uh, oh, hold on. What about four, What about agendas 14 days ahead? So we, we recognize there's a challenge with knowing everything that's going to be on the agenda. We do think that you can put a lot of things on an, a, a standing agenda. So you can have review of the financials. You can have an update on maintenance. You can have review of ACC requests, or you can have a standing agenda item for uh, violations. If you're gonna do something unusual, like a approval of a special assessment budget, or you're going to have on the agenda removal of a board member or something like that, then you probably would be safest by sending out a additional notice to comply with the 14 days notice. Is that required? We don't know. And until a court starts interpreting what the language really means, then it's not gonna be certain. I think it's not reasonable to expect that the legislature intended that every meeting would require its own special mailed notice to every member of the community because the whole purpose of having certain kinds of notice in advance was to reduce costs for an HOA. Now, you don't want to have to send out 3,000 notices to the 3,000 members of your community when you have a small line item on your, your board meeting agenda. Uh, on the other hand, you want significant issues to be known by your membership. 
And so I think eventually there will be a court case which distinguishes between the significant and the routine, and then we'll have clear guidance. Until then, you're gonna have to, I would say, get advice from managers, get advice from attorneys, try and figure out what seems reasonable and give reasonable notice on those decisions. I think probably there's like a sliding scale, right? Like the more likely the action is to be subject to challenge by your owners, the more we would probably recommend that you send out specific notice of that item. So the perfect example is the board voting to, uh, you know, propose a special assessment um, or the board voting to sign a, you know, $1 million, I don't know, strip and reclad contract, whatever the, the case might be. If it's something that, that is going to, you know, create hardship for your owners or that's going to make them likely to fight back on whatever that issue is, then go ahead and send out the specific agenda item in advance of that particular board meeting, complying with the notice requirements. If it's routine, normal stuff that people are unlikely to pay any attention to, I, I agree with Ken that having to send out the individual meetings agenda um, is seems like overkill. So I think maybe that's it. Gil, can you confirm, are we done? We are done, folks. Hey, get out there and enjoy that sunshine. Wear your sunblock. We'll see you Thanks next Wednesday. <laughs>